So um, I'm supposed to talk this morning about an evidence-based approach to non-invasive ventilation in neonates in 20 minutes. That will be very, very difficult. So what I will try to do is just go over a few main points that I think are important for you to take home with you. First of all, um, many of you probably don't know where is Arkansas. You've heard of Bill Clinton. Arkansas is where Bill Clinton came from. It's sort of in the, um, the lower center of the United States. Now let's see if I have a pointer. Sorry, I'm, I'm deficient in, in technology. Oh well. Um, this is our children's hospital. Arkansas is a very big state, and we only have one children's hospital and one medical school. So, we, where's the laser? Laser. That one? Ah, thank you. So, we receive um, patients from an extremely large area and have a NICU of over a hundred beds, um, helicopters and all of those things. So it's a very, very large uh, organization and our medical school as well. So um, it, it, there are many more things other than Bill Clinton um, in our state of Arkansas. So I just have to say before I begin that I think on behalf of all of the speakers from the United States, I would like to issue an apology for this. <laughs> we are very sorry. <laughs> and no more will be said. All right, so there are several types of non-invasive ventilation that we use. There is nasal CPAP, which we've talked much about in the last couple of days, and many of you, I think, were at the, uh, the workshop. There is what we call non-invasive or nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. There is high-flow nasal cannula. And then there are some new things, which I will touch on briefly, including high-frequency nasal ventilation and something called NIV-NAVA. Now, isn't this a happy baby on CPAP? <laughs> so, we would like all of our babies to do well on CPAP. There are many studies looking at CPAP, and instead of quoting all of the literature, I will just summarize by saying that CPAP has been shown to reduce mortality and respiratory failure in respiratory distress syndrome. When used early, reduces the need for mechanical ventilation and surfactant, reduces the incidence of BPD, though not dramatically, but it does a little bit, and death or BPD, and prevents extubation failure after initial extubation. Some of these studies are from even the pre-surfactant era. So a couple of recent articles that we need to be aware of. Just a few years back, a Cochrane Review, prophylactic versus selective use of surfactant in preventing morbidity and mortality in preterm infants. The author's conclusion was that recent large trials that reflect current practice, things change, things change constantly in what we're doing. And if we looked at the utilization of maternal steroids, which has increased dramatically, and the routine post-delivery stabilization on CPAP, as opposed to immediate intubation and surfactant use, studies demonstrate less risk of chronic lung disease or death when using the early stabilization on CPAP using additionally selective surfactant administration to infants requiring intubation. We must not forget about surfactant. We must use it when appropriate if CPAP is not showing the effect that we wish. A more recent, just last year, review 
prophylactic CPAP for preventing morbidity and mortality in very preterm infants concluded, when compared to mechanical ventilation, prophylactic nasal CPAP in very preterm infants reduces the need for mechanical ventilation and surfactant and also reduces the incidence of BPD and death or BPD. So CPAP is something that we all should be having available to our preterm infants in the delivery room. Now, something that I'm asked all the time is which CPAP is better? And you will find many groups of people who, um, like football teams, are cheering for their particular type of CPAP. Please be aware that there are no studies showing an absolute benefit of one kind of CPAP over another. Bubble CPAP is simple, it's cheap, and it may improve gas exchange and enhance lung recruitment. The feeling is that perhaps the oscillations caused by the bubbling of the gas may improve gas exchange. There are some studies, particularly um, from Australia and some of our own work, that suggest this may be true. However, um, predominantly they have been done in animal models who are intubated. So we still uh, do not know if this form of CPAP is, quote, better than any other. Variable flow CPAP, which is called infant flow, or CPAP, um, which gives a bi-level CPAP, uh, in, enhances lung recruitment and decreases work of breathing. I think this has been shown fairly definitively, particularly by work from our lab and some patient studies that we did. However, does this translate into better outcome? No one knows whether this is true or not. This is a popular form of uh, delivery in Europe and also in, in Canada, a little bit less so in the United States. The bi-level devices may also help prevent apnea and, of course, can be used um, sort of for synchronized NIPPV. The synchrony that is given, uh, which uses a Gracepie capsule, which is attached to the abdomen, is only really effective about 70% of the time in synchronizing the breasts. Constant flow devices, meaning you're not changing the flow, but you're changing the CPAP uh, level, are easy to use and can deliver uh, NIPPV, and all ventilators can provide some form of constant flow uh, or NIPPV, and um, this is an option that may be available to you. And if you're thinking perhaps your baby may need to be reintubated, sometimes it's simpler to use the ventilator, and then it's there at the bedside if you need to reintubate the baby. There is a device called the RAM cannula, which is exceedingly popular in the United States. Uh, and also in several other countries. I will not spend a lot of time on it uh, other than to say it is, um, works a little differently than regular CPAP devices. It is, um, has a high resistance to flow, does not have an expiratory limb, and does not deliver the CPAP that you set because of the resistance uh, through the cannula itself. So those of you that are using RAM cannula, it is a good idea to, uh, if you want a CPAP of six, for instance, to set it at eight, because the difference is about two centimeters of water. So you have to know your device in order to give the appropriate CPAP amount that you may want. That is certainly true of a ventilator, and it is also certainly true of your CPAP devices. Know how they work, know what the advantages and disadvantages are, and know what the um, possible problems and possible benefits might be. NIPPV, or non-invasive intermittent positive pressure ventilation, 
is currently not synchronized, though there are some studies to be started in Europe looking at a possible synchronization. It is still a flow transducer and because of leak um, is likely not to be incredibly accurate. We will see. Um, so this is a non-synchronized form for all practical purposes. It is given with CPAP prongs and it may decrease work of breathing, it may increase tidal volume and improve oxygenation, and it may simply in, in, increase the mean airway pressure um, and have uh, and, and work by that effect. Our friend Dr. Kirpalani uh, published a large trial comparing non-invasive ventilation strategies in preterm infants just a few years back. This was over a thousand infants comparing NIPPV with CPAP. In this trial, a pragmatic trial, any form of NIPPV was allowed, any form of CPAP in any time frame up to 28 days. In this particular trial, no differences were found between NIPPV and CPAP. However, a Cochrane review in 2014, looking specifically at extubation, found that NIPPV reduces extubation failure, need for reintubation more effectively than CPAP. Interestingly, in this study, the five trials that use some form of synchronized NIPPV, and the majority would be those that were using the Gracepe capsule, showed a statistically significant benefit in preventing extubation failure. This was a quite interesting finding, and we'll come back to that in a bit. So it, um, in t just this year, 2017, there was an article published in JAMA Pediatrics, Interventions to Improve Rates of Successful Extubation in Preterm Infants, which found that in this case, NIPPV was superior to CPAP in preventing extubation failure, and that in this case, high flow nasal cannula and CPAP had similar efficacy. <clears throat> so what about high flow nasal cannula? It is very popular, and I have found in my state, which is a very poor state, that many of our hospitals that are lower level um, use high flow nasal cannula and do not have any capability of giving CPAP. So uh, we need to have some idea of what high flow nasal cannula is offering us. One of the problems is that the amount of distending pressure is not measured. And this can be of concern if the cannula size you use is very large or the nasal passages are obstructed. The CPAP that you give will vary with the flow you use, the leak present, the size of the cannula, and the size of the infant. High flow nasal cannula also works by a different mechanism, more of a washout of the uh, hypopharynx and reducing CO2 and, in, and decreasing resistance in that manner. So the mechanism is different. Most of us would not give high flow to give a positive pressure because we do not know what that positive pressure will be. Just last year, a study was published by Roberts, nasal high flow therapy for primary respiratory support in preterm infants. This was a trial of over 500 infants. The trial was stopped early by the Data Safety and Monitoring Board. Whenever that happens, one has to suspect that one therapy was much better or much worse than the other. The conclusion from this trial was that when high-flow nasal cannula was used as primary support, now remember, I'm talking about primary support, not after extubation, where it was, has been shown in some studies to be equal to CPAP, but to be used as primary support in preterm infants with respiratory distress, high flow resulted in a significantly higher treatment failure than did nasal CPAP, 
25.5% versus 13.3% with a 95% confidence interval of 5.8 to 18.7, highly statistically significant. So what about future directions? This is the person we consult in our NICU when we want to know who's, what's going to happen. <laughs> Some of you may, heard of high may have heard of high-frequency nasal ventilation. There is very little data on this mode of non-invasive support, but it can be used with any high-frequency device and has been studied in animal models and some small retrospective clinical trials. It has been successful in some infants who were failing nasal CPAP or NIPPV. However, there are no randomized trials and there's no definitive evidence that this is a method we should use at this time. Large prospective clinical trials are needed to evaluate this mode of support and I would not recommend its use at this time until we have more data. I'm going to conclude by talking a little bit about NABA which is Neurally Adjusted Ventilatory Assist, because NABA or similar ways of providing support, I feel may be a future direction in which we are going to go. The synchrony of breaths has always been a problem because of the delay time and because of the leak, particularly during non-invasive ventilation. NABA uses a catheter which measures the electrical activity of the diaphragm and is used to assist the patient's breathing in complete synchrony and in complete proportion to the patient's own effort. The coupling between the diaphragm and the ventilator is virtually simultaneous. NAVA is available and can be used and is approved for both invasive and non-invasive ventilation. The problem is that it is proprietary and only available on one ventilator at this time, which is the servo ventilator by McKay. I would just briefly show you how this works. This is the catheter. There we go which is placed down as an NG tube, and you can use it for feeding. So you do not need to have two catheters placed, two NG catheters placed. The catheter has a series of electrodes that allow you to see exactly that the catheter is in an appropriate position. So it's very easy to place. Anyone can do it in our unit. The nurses do it. You get a, um, a waveform that shows you that it's in the actual right position. And then you get, now that doesn't show up very well. Oh, it's a little bit better up there. Then you get this waveform, which is the electrical activity of the diaphragm. You can then set what's called the NAVA level. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Courtney, so let me, just, let me just give you a very brief example. What we have here is the diaphragm, the peak. Courtney, they can't see that pointer unless you point They can't see the, the pointer? Yeah, you have to point to the screen. Oh, all right. Let me do that then. Except the... All right, let's try this. <laughs> Hello. So these are your waveforms that you would normally, normally see with your pressure flow and tidal volume. But at the bottom, there's another waveform. That is the diaphragm. Over here, the very bottom, you see something called EDI peak and EDI min. That simply means the peak is the peak of the breath, the minimum is the tonic diaphragm as the breath expiration is completed. Now, what is the beauty of NABA is that every breath 
can be assisted with pressure if needed. If, if, I think that means I'm supposed to stop. I'm almost done. Um, so the um, formula at the bottom shows you that the peak inspiratory pressure is the NABA level times the peak minus the minimum plus the PEEP. So let's just see if our NABA level is 1, what's the difference between the 11 and the 2.7, let's call it 3 for simplicity, is 8. And the PEEP on this machine is 5. So what is our peak pressure? 8 plus 5, 13, which is what the ventilator is showing. So it is a, a, an exciting possibility for allowing the baby to breathe in complete synchrony and completely assisted as the baby wants. So um, many of us around the world, Dr. Kirpalani is leading a trial that hopefully will show whether NAVA is the way to go. We call it the DIVA trial, or the Diaphragmatic Initiated Ventilatory Assist. This is an international trial of non-invasive NAVA compared to routine CPAP or NIPPV with a primary outcome in reduction of BPD. The grant has been submitted, so everyone think good thoughts because we need a lot of money, and hopefully, if our grant is funded, we will get some answers and be able to come back to you in a few years and let you know if this form of ventilation is going to be useful for our babies. So in summary, use CPAP early and use it often. Extubate to NIPPV if NIPPV is available to you because the success rate may be greater. High frequency nasal cannula is not the optimal choice for early respiratory support. CPAP is the optimal choice for early respiratory support. High flow nasal cannula may be useful when the baby is extubated um, from the ventilator. NAVA and high, and high frequency nasal ventilation may be future directions for non-invasive respiratory support that you will be hearing about in the future. And an additional comment, for I have not spoken much about it, do not forget about surfactant. If surfactant is needed, use it early rather than later, hopefully within the first couple of hours, and extubate your baby as soon as possible. And I will leave you with a picture of our city of Little Rock at night. And I thank you very much for having me. Talking about CPAP and everything, and going even further with the future studies of Dr. Kriplani and others, why doesn't globally, worldwide, CPAP get used early? Individual variations, doctor's choices. Uh, why doesn't everybody do early CPAP in, in preemies, uh, as you've shown? because a bubble CPAP setup is relatively inexpensive and easy to learn. And um, it, it's one of the, the big questions I've always had um, as, as to why uh, folks don't keep up a little better with the literature. And um, you know, I, I read once that it takes seven years for the general uh, population of doctors to accept uh, a therapy that has been shown by evidence-based medicine to be effective. So it's wonderful to see you, Dr. Bora. Let's talk later. <laughs> it's the lunchtime. Thank you very much. I wonder, I wonder if I could ask um, Dr. Murky to comment on that in relation perhaps to India. Um, I think it's more to do with the non-availability of machines and also lack of skills. Um, but I think the program in the country is uh, reaching now. We have been able to cover the states of West Bengal where the government was involved and uh, the NHM of the state was instrumental in getting uh, the CPAP machines in most of the SNCUs, followed by Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. So we hope that it will spread to more people. And Well, I think conferences like this one are for spreading the news, spreading the word and helping 
to um, get the evidence out there uh, for everyone to use. So uh, I just I just want to say thank you, Dr. Srinivas, and thank you, everyone, for having a wonderful conference. Everyone has been so interested, and um, I'm thinking that CPAP will explode now in India. <laughs> thank um, you. Uh, we had one form of CPAP, from Seattle CPAP. Uh, any update on that? I'm am sorry, I didn't catch you. We had Seattle CPAP, like the the mode, of, the way by which the CPAP can be delivered. Seattle group, Houston people are. No, doing it. I don't even think it's available. That's my friend Rob De Blasi who invented that. Um, it sounds like a really good idea, but I don't really know uh, where it's gone or whether there's been any any trials uh, looking this at that. Perhaps I can add to that. There's been a small human trial uh, in um, Texas. Uh, which still has not reported, um, uh, but which did not find any harm. Uh, signals um, for uh, benefit were really, um, it was a pilot trial. Uh, a more large trial is now being conducted by uh, Dr. Carl Bax uh, out of Columbus at a multi-site trial. So we're awaiting that information. Uh, I think the simple question of uh, why we do not use delivery room CPAP as much as we used to is uh, not so easy to answer. The fundamentals are uh, rather bright, but however, it uh, starts right from the logistics of how a delivery room is designed. If you have a delivery room very far off from the neonatal ICU, and you have got a delivery room CPAP which we have to deliver and move the baby in, we are again stuck with the absence of a portable blender, and when we don't have a blender, the question which many people ask is, is it better to bring the baby with a bag and mask to the neonatal ICU, or do you want to give 100% oxygen for a preemie when it is not required by giving delivery room CPAP? So unless these portable blenders, uh, the, the cylinders, which are say, aluminum, lightweight, and even the design, for example, in my hospital, a very old hospital, uh, I have the delivery room uh, on a different floor from the neonatal ICU, so you can imagine the, uh, the logistical issues in moving these things, especially when large numbers are there. It's okay in smaller hospitals or private hospitals where few deliveries take place. So while the concept is excellent, implementation may not be as easy as we would like to do it on paper. Thank you. Thank you. And um, were, I, were you the one that brought this up during our workshop? Because I know we discussed this very point. And I would love to hear from some other people uh, in India because um, that is a real dilemma. If you uh, do you give CPAP uh, on 100%? Or do you not give CPAP and um, uh, in, in transport the transport the baby um, on a hundred percent because you have a transporter that doesn't have a blender and um, it may be very difficult to uh, to do to do both and so I really don't know the answer to that. Giving a hundred percent oxygen is clearly not a good thing to do. Um, and CPAP is clearly a very good thing to do. And I guess, I guess if I had to answer, uh, I would suggest give the CPAP and get to the nursery as fast as you can. Uh, because if you don't give the CPAP, you're going to de-recruit the lung quite significantly. Um, but I'd, I'd like to hear other opinions on that. What does, what does our eminent well, panel think? Well, what I was going to suggest was that we move this to a later discussion oh. after we've heard um, from Dr. Clyde Wright. I'm mindful that there's a world authority to my left here on CPAP who hasn't yet given his views. So we can discuss this um, at the end together with the many experts in the audience from India who've been conversant with CPAP. Thank you, Dr. Cotney.